Joining us now, Vanity Fair special correspondent and NBC News contributor Gabriel Sherman, whose new reporting raises red flags about the president's state of mind inside the White House. Also with us, Washington bureau chief for USA Today, Susan Page, and New York Times reporter Jeremy Peters, who's writing about a new conservative effort to make Mitch McConnell the symbol of a toxic Washington. A lot to get to. We'll start with Gabe. Yeah, Gabe, what's your takeaway uh, from your reporting? A lot to, a lot to talk about there. Yeah, I mean, really, these are the people closest to the president who are concerned uh, about his stability at this moment as his le legislative agenda is stalled. It's getting nothing through Congress. He's picking uh, fights, doing nuclear brink brinksmanship with North Korea. And what's troubling is that sources inside and outside the White House are talking to reporters, not just me, NBC News and others, about this president, you know, really seeming to come apart at the seams. And I think all eyes are on General Kelly because his relationship with the president is becoming what people close to both men say is untenable. And I think the yesterday the move of his deputy to DHS is possibly a warning sign that he may be eyeing the exits. Well, and and after reading your piece, I was, I was reminded Tom Barrick, who of course is a long a, friend, a long time friend, a confidant, someone who's been extremely loyal to the Someone president. talked about as a possible new chief of state. Right. Spoke yeah. at the committee talking about how he's been shocked and stunned by the president's recent behavior. This is, again, coming from somebody that's been around him for 30, 40, 50 years. It's very telling. Yeah, I was stunned by that uh, interview, you know, going in the pages of the Washington Post to talk about, uh, you know, really this president doesn't seem to be listening <laughs> to anybody. And, you know, I, I reported how General Kelly has looked to try to sequester the president. He's going to be returning to Mar-a-Lago later this month. And as we all know, uh, Trump loves to hold court in the dining room soliciting policy advice from members and guests, which is completely inappropriate and not what the president <laughs> should be doing. And General Kelly wants to keep him out of the dining Dining room, but as one uh, senior Republican official told me, you know, you can't do that. Donald Trump in Mar-a-Lago is, you know, it, it's one and the same. You can't keep him sequestered in his bed right. now. So I think we are going to be seeing, you know, really a flashpoint down there. So Susan, uh, it it appears that the I don't see any change. Do you, uh, since Kelly has arrived and taken on the position of chief of staff. And I'm wondering, I, I know, Gabe, you think that uh, the new uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, position filled by Kirsten Nielsen, Nielsen yeah. is a, maybe a sign that Kelly is leaving? Or could it be a sign, because she has an incredible reputation, she's very close with Kelly, that he might be shoring up the cabinet around the president for whatever might happen next? You know, I think uh, General Kelly has made a big difference in the White House. When you look you at the staff, difference? when you look at the, he's the chief of the staff. He's not the chief of the president. And even talking about the, pre mm -hmm. the chief of staff trying to keep the president from going to a place he wants to go, that is new territory, mm -hmm. right? Pre presidents are in charge of their chief of staff. So while I think General Kelly's made a big difference looking down, it's unrealistic to think, I think, that he's going to be able to change the way the president himself operates. And you see this isolation of the president, not just in the White House staff, but in the previous story on the congressional investigation and the mm -hmm. House Intelligence Committee, he is increasingly isolated, even from Republican members of Congress mm -hmm. who were inclined to try to protect him. I want to get to Jeremy in just a second, yeah. but Gabe, I want to ask you about one detail in the story among the many that jump out, yeah. and that is that Steve Bannon has told people he believes Donald Trump has only a 30% chance of finishing the full term, this mm -hmm. first term. What is he basing that on? This is, of course, yeah, how do you the get guy. To 30? This is the, very precise. This yeah. is, of course, the guy <laughs> who has defended Donald Trump at all turns, whether yes. he's in the white, in the West Wing or, or outside, mm -hmm. why does he believe he won't finish his term? Well, people very close to Bannon tell me that there are multiple issues. You know, one <laughs> obviously is the Russia investigation. You know, Steve Bannon has told people that he believes Jared Kushner is wrapped up in this. It was Jared Kushner's decision, uh, among others. He was part of the decision to fire uh, James Comey. That's something Bannon has been vocal about, and he's worried about where this may lead. The other thing we see is Bannon feels that Trump is uh, abandoning the nationalist base and is picking fights with everyone, including Mitch McConnell, has basically no friends in Washington. And he is a very isolated president. I think that is the thinking behind how he thinks he might not make it a full term. And again, I, Jeremy Peters, I was just saying last, um, last block about how it's, it's very telling while all these people are questioning Donald Trump's uh, mindset, his stability, that he continues doing things that no rational actor no rational politician would do he is he's screaming about needing 50 votes and yet he continues 
to insult and attack the very people that would help him get to 50 votes. And it's, you know, it's continued. He's, he's picked, a, picked a new fight this week. So how are the Republicans in the, on the Hill, other than Ben Sass, responding to a president who's now talking about stripping uh, the press of their First Amendment rights and freedoms? exactly how they've been responding all along to various controversial and, and unbelievable statements the president has made in the past with a deafening silence, Joe. I mean, you, you know this, that they're not going to break with the president unless they suddenly realize that he no longer has 80, 90 percent approval ratings in their district. It's, it's just not going to happen. And there will it, be a select the, few it's like really, Corker, It's but, sort of the Harvey Weinstein thing. The most yeah. powerful actresses in, in Hollywood, yeah. are, they didn't start talking till they found out that he was going to actually be fired from his own company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, and and from the out, I mean, you not only have the president picking a fight with Mitch McConnell and, and his allies on, on the Hill, you have Steve Bannon doing it from the outside. I mean, this is a major reason uh, why Steve Bannon left the White House. I mean, the, the situation for him was untenable inside the White House to begin with, but 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 he knew that once he got on the outside, he would be freer to wage war with this, this constellation of other conservative groups against the Republican establishment. And as Steve Bannon interviews candidates and, and, and tries to figure out who he's going to endorse in these Senate primaries, he sits them down at his dining room table and he says, I want you to make a pledge to me. Will you pledge not to support Mitch McConnell for Republican leader? <clears throat> and I mean, that is an extraordinary thing because it, at, the, at the same time that's going on, you have other groups, uh, who, who the, these conservative leaders, um, movement leaders who've been around in politics for a long time and have kind of always picked fights with the Republican establishment. They are calling not only for Mitch McConnell to step down, but they are trying to make him like Nancy Pelosi was. Mm. They are making mm. him the face of, of the toxicity of Washington leadership. Now, just think about that <laughs> for a second. They are using the same strategy that they used against a member of the opposing party against a leader of their own party. And, and you know, I mean, I, I, what's unclear to me is whether or not this works and, 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 and these right. Republican primary cha challengers kind of barrel through the primaries here like suicide bombers, or whether or not something's really different this time. And, 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 the, and the, the anger among the base, uh, the disappointment that Republicans haven't gotten anything done is, is enough to really shake up leadership. Yeah, I'm, I, uh, I watched the Sean Hannity interview with Donald Trump last night. Amazing, amazing that, that you can you. Oh, sit, good. you can get an hour with the president and oh. make literally zero news. Wait a second, so you did that instead of watching? <laughs> I had both playoffs. going on. I had yeah. both going on. I'm, I was really rooting, that is, for, that rooting is a, against the Yankees. And that is a misspent year. The, 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 the most that. important, I'm That's getting important. to a very important point. Huh? <laughs> the most important part of that Sean Hannity interview with Trump was not when Trump was on. It was what happened right afterwards. What happened he afterwards? took his mic, went through the crowd, yeah. asked them all about what they felt about Trump, and then asked them what they felt about the Republicans in Congress. Everyone praised Trump. Everyone very much uh, opposed, uh, upset with the Republicans in Congress. Right. And that goes to Jeremy's point, which is all of this anger and animus that's mm. rising in the Republican Party is being directed not at the principal actor, but at the people on the Hill. But this is, Susan, this is, this is what I've been calling from the beginning, the 30% solution. <laughs> you can, I, I, Democrats hate when I say this. You can go back to 2004, 2005, and you can find a third are 40 percent of Democrats who believe George W. Bush blew up the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. We've got the polls. Politico reporter Ben Smith wrote an article about it. You can find the crazies on both sides. But Donald Trump, as Tom Barrick said, he's just focusing on the hardcore right and, you know, doing Hannity and having the crowd out there. And you talk about yeah. his isolation. You see that now, I think, even in his, in his aspirations, because the idea he is now focusing on the things he can do by executive action, like action on North Korea, or like the d throwing the Iran nuclear deal, or the health care uh, right. executive order that we believe he's going to sign that's mm -hmm. going to undercut some of the fundamentals of the Affordable Care Act. It's as though he's given up on the idea that he can form alliances that are effective enough with Congress to get through big legislation. It's entirely possible he'll go into the midterms with no major legislative achievement nothing to give and Gabe so, at the yeah. end of the day is that what disturbs the people on the inside the most that he does he just is incapable mentally and emotionally of 
piecing together a, ma a majority to pass legislation? Yeah, I mean, flailing, and you know, part of the reason we just mentioned Hannity, he's sitting down with these friendly venues like Sean Hannity or Mike Huckabee because mm -hmm. he does not, and his handlers do not want him in an adversarial television uh, interview being you, you on live said something TV. Something fascinating about yeah. when he said, when, when he didn't, yeah. when he decided not to do 60 minutes. People were relieved. They, they said, the White House. quote, he's lost a step. Yeah, people inside the White House were relieved that that interview did not happen because in a live TV in interview, they can't control him on Twitter, but they can keep him from embarrassing himself sitting yeah. down with a real journalist. And Republicans wow. walking the plank uh, for him might want to watch that Hannity yeah. interview uh, and what happened out. I wouldn't really call it an interview so much as a conversation. <laughs> an information. <Yeah. laughs> Gabe Sherman, thank you. Your story about the president is now up. I scene out of like when Itchy and Scratchy were nice at to each point, other. At one point, <laughs> Trump told Sean he was very proud of him. Ew. That tells oh, you all my God. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. What we is have to go. We have to go. Up Oh, okay, vanity so the Vanity Fair, Fair incredible is, story. is up thank now. You. Uh, Jeremy Peters, thank you as well. We'll check out your Thanks. reporting in the New York Times. Susan Page, stay with us, please. Come. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.